So this is it. You see it. We had some complaints on Twitter that we should have added a female. <laughs> All of yeah. Yeah. But you know, uh but we're only three, you know. If if I I agree if it's a panel of ten or six, but I don't know. Well, well. Yeah, it's next time, it? next time. Next or, time. Or Alexis, you shave your 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 <laughs> yeah, beard yeah. and you you make some makeup and and we'll call you uh, Alexia. For a week. You'll be you will be Alexia. Yeah. The the previous the previous journal club was 50 50 around three three yeah, yeah, yeah. Small, they, uh, yeah. but these are people on Twitter and they they just look for this I yeah. I blocked uh, the person I don't know who the person is but it's like a manual spotter or something yeah, yeah. and then, then we the, next the, time the we will have uh, uh, we will uh, look that we have a female as well. <laughs> No, 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 but it's 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 the, the, the whole it has we have to look at the whole series. Like yeah, I'm I'm the least person, the last person you can you can really yeah, exactly. a fan of that. I try to get so many females on board. Are we on YouTube live? Now or three like minutes it. or whatever? The, uh, the, uh, are we uh, attendees? They, they can just chat. Uh, they yeah, can... uh, we are live apparently, so we should watch what we say. Mm -hmm. We always do. <laughs> okay. Okay. Last two minutes. We also broadcast uh, to our YouTube channel. We don't yeah. know people, yeah, in the same time. I see it's live. Live, on, live on YouTube. Uh -huh. Yeah, live. <laughs> Sitting tonight? I don't think so. It's popular yes, but nowadays. I, I forgot uh, what's exactly. Oh, spin. Oh, how can I say? Bias. You know, bias. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, 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 they bias me. I wrote that. I saw that paper. I want to see the paper if I'm if I'm one of the references and how I score. Because one of the things that when I publish something, I really, really like to to have ve be very critical at what I put in my conclusions. Like as the, that's something that I've learned during the years. Like you really don't emphasize too much on your one P value that you found, but just uh, focus on your limitations, whatever, and what you found. And don't make, don't make recommendations from ind individual studies. That's also important. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. It's time. Uh, I, I want to open the session. I, I, I want to start with my uh, intro speech. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the EHS Journal Club tonight. Alexios Todori and I will uh, manage the session. This month's article is Robotic Utility for Surgical Treatment of Hernias, Robust Hernia Project. The article was published in Chirguia Española, Española, the leading article of the article, uh, leading uh, author of the article, uh, our EHS president, Philip Meisens, is with us. His contribution to the abdominal wall surgery is massive. I would like to share my intro slide and I, I'd like to tell something about our uh, relation and uh, robotic surgery. Let's have a look at this slide. These are pictures from the Philips OR taken in October 2016. The OR has windows, as you see, and a beautiful landscape behind it. 
And this is the first robotic tar case in Europe. Actually, we, uh, we, uh, Philip made two robotic cases uh, that day. The, this, uh, probably this is the uh, very large primary ventral hernia, Philip. It's, it was around 13 uh, centimeters in width, if, uh, if I don't remember wrong. Yeah, uh, something like that. Yeah, this is the first robotic tar case in Europe. Our friend, robotic surgeon, Conrad Balliser, came from the States and I, I came from the Turkey and Conrad made some proctoring and I observed the session. Uh, Philip made two robot tars uh, that day and then he cooked us and the, the, it, was, it was very delicious and the wine's brand name was Stoppa. It was very uh, fantastic. Hernia trip actually, and remembering and embracing the past as joyful, actually excellent. Uh, for the session, Philip Meisens will make a brief presentation of the article, and then we will ask the questions. Uh, I would like to remind you again: this meeting also be, be broadcasted live on our YouTube channel. Yes, Philip, it's your turn to speak. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Actually, uh, one of the funny things is that, that Hakan was there because he is on uh, in social media. Actually, I, I discussed uh, the start of the robotic program in our uh, clinic with uh, Conrad Balliser on the International Hernia Collabor Collaboration. Hakan said, oh, I wanna be there. I said, okay, just come. And so he booked his flight and he came to a uh, to join us, which was, uh, I think, the first time that I, I came in contact with Hakan, who is now, of course, uh, our leading person for uh, uh, social media in the European Hernia Society, doing such a great job on it. Uh, so I'd like to share my screen. By now, I hope that I've learned that. And if it's not, just tell me. Uh, OK. So robotic utility, I hope you see my screen. If not, tell me. Robotic utility for surgical treatment of hernias, the robust hernia project. Okay, I know this is a uh, manual, so we have three male surgeons there, but uh, if you follow the series, you know that many female surgeons also are invited in this uh, journal club. So uh, please Philip. don't be offended by that. Anyway. It's not uh, full screen, Philip. Is it not full screen? Yeah, I, I see the whole slides. You don't see slides? Uh, I see the whole slides, uh, not the single one. Okay. So you need to, to start the presentation for, uh, to, to share the presentation. We should know by just, now how just, it works, no? Just see the presentation, not the screen. Yeah, it'll come, no, no problem after so many times. Is that okay? Not, it's not presentation mode. Yeah, it is. In my, we just tested it. Was it better when we tested it? Yeah, we, How you see, Alex? No, um, you, you have to choose um, either the entire, uh, uh, the, the presentation mode exactly there. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Well, uh, you see it? It's not no, but because you have uh, shared the PowerPoint uh, program, not the presentation. Okay. Uh, perhaps you can try again. Yeah, yeah. We'll get there. No problem. I close it. Uh, what am I sharing now? Nothing. this better yeah now it works sorry we, we should think that uh, by two years we should have known that anyway disclosures i do some uh, research with mesh companies as you see and i am a proctor for intuitive that so there might be some spin in this presentation anyway 
I am the current president of the European Hernia Society, as mentioned, and uh, it is, of course, my duty to tell you, and, and unfortunately, we have to uh, uh, mention that uh, one of the previous presidents, Volker Kupelik, uh, has died last week. He will be buried on Friday. Uh, for those younger uh, might not know him that well, but of course he's been a very important person in the Hernia Society, European Hernia Society. He's been really pioneering and he actually brought Hernia Society to a different level as the head of the department of Aachen, which was uh, probably one of the first ones to really invest really in research in, uh, in hernia surgery and uh, taking it to a different level. This is a picture of 2011 when uh, I hosted, I had the privilege to host the European Hernia Society in Ghent, where at the time he was present, this is with his wife, and this is during the dancing party. So uh, goodbye, Volker. Thank you very much for all that you've done. And, and of course, our, uh, our condolences to uh, the family and all the friends uh, in Germany. I'm a hernia surgeon and uh, I'm spending most of my time in the console of the robot now. And if Von, uh, Volker Schumplik would see me, he would be a bit amazed probably, but he would probably like it as well. And I must admit when 10 years ago or 11 years ago in 2011, we had the European Hernia Society in Ghent, there was nothing about robot actually. Uh, robot didn't exist yet at that time. Uh, for me, it started 2016 when we moved to this new hospital with which came a new robot, the XI, Da Vinci robot, which was used only two days a week. And there was actually a demand for, like, oh, do we have as, uh, as the part, department chief of general surgery, do we have a uh, use for the robot in, in general surgery? By visiting many congresses and to the American Hernia Society, I became in contact with surgeons like Conrad Balliser, who really saw an, a big value in, in, in advancing robotic surgery also for hernia repair. That's why uh, coming back, we decided to put on a robust hernia project. And initially the concept was to do 100 cases, 50 groins, 40 smaller ventrals and 10 uh, larger hernias needing component separation. And we call this the robust hernia project. So what do you have with the robot? You have enhanced visualization. You have the dexterity of the wristed instruments. You have the surgeon's ergonomics sitting in the console rather than standing next to the patient in awkward positions. You have the increased independence of the surgeon. You hold control of your own camera and you have the immersive effect of the console. The big question, of course, is these technological benefits, advantages, can we use them to do better patient care? And that was really the quest for our uh, robust hernia project. Last year, at the invitation, actually, of Manuel Lopez Cano from Barcelona, we've written a paper on our robust hernia project, uh, describing the first three years, uh, which I would like to share with you of our, of our quest. And when we started the project, it, we, we thought, okay, we were before that, I was also robot skeptic, like you could call it, uh, saying it takes too long, it's too expensive, and there's no benefit for the patient. And then if, if you divide it into the three uh, main indications we have in, in abdominal wall surgery, groin, hernia, ventrals, and robotar, this comes down to nine research questions. And my quest has been a bit like to to try to evaluate these nine questions. The first one, it takes too long for groin hernias. We explored with our 50 first cases, you see the timing goes down. And a bit to my surprise basically is, is, is that we found that after a certain uh, learning time and after a learning curve, we found that the, the timing actually for a robotic uh, assisted groin hernia repair and laparoscopic repair was similar. Uh, was in the same category. So I think we've answered that first question. And the second question is economics. It costs too much. Okay, but how much more does it cost to do a groin hernia robotically compared to a, a laparoscopic case? We, therefore, we've done a, a retrospective study which uh, looked at 270 conventional cases and 404. It's a retrospective study 
baseline data were not not really uh, much different uh, between the both groups. But on the outcome data, once of once again in this larger cohort, it's confirmed that the the, the timing, the skin to skin operative time for a robotic case doesn't is not longer than for a conventional case. Uh, Complications are low, as you would expect, and you, you, you have to have with groin in your repair. The main post-operative uh, complication being urinary tension uh, with no difference in between the two uh, arms. Uh, we were able to do more cases in a day, uh, outpatient treatment in daycare, 70% uh, against 60%. Of course, it's retrospective and, and there's a lot of many limitations to the study, but we still were able to do more cases uh, in daycare. The, the main outcome, of course, the primary outcome was the cost of the, uh, of the difference between the, the, the surgeries. And there was a gap of about 650 euros, uh, which is mainly, as you see in this simplified graph, uh, the material that you use during your surgical procedure. Will it stay so expensive? I don't know, because the study is already outdated, although only published last year, uh, because the pricing has gone down. As you, if you're a, a user of robotic uh, instruments, you might know that, that last year uh, prices went down. But for a groin, that's about less than 20%. And we all know, so know that competition is coming. So... Uh, maybe in the coming years, prices will go down and, and will become uh, more or less comparable to a conventional laparoscopy. Um, is there a clinical benefit? That, that's a difficult question. I think it's difficult to do better uh, than for a, a straightforward, non-complicated groin hernia repair. Uh, conventional patients are doing so well. How are you going to do better? Uh, but on the other hand, if you look at the, the data from that publication, you see that my the number of open repairs has decreased in my own practice from about with about 10%. And why is that? That's because we're taking more complex cases, which is after abdominal prostatectomy, uh, large inguinoscrotals, recurrences after pre preptinal mesh, which before would be an open uh, surgery, Liechtenstein in my operation, as you see here. There was a migration towards minimal invasive also in these more complex uh, indications. So is there a benefit? Probably not for the large majority of our groin hernias. Is it too expensive? Yes, probably for the large majority, but there might be a niche uh, in the groin hernia repair uh, patients indications where we might see a benefit. Central hernias, as you see here in the, the, the graphs from the publication that we're discussing today, you see decline in the open uh, surgery for the primary ventral hernias from uh, more, than, more than half to uh, about 10%. Um, what is that? That's a shift away from these mesh devices, of which I've used a lot uh, during several years, but uh, it takes us a bit too long probably to explain why we migrated, but on a similar thing you see with the incisional hernia. See, actually, the open repairs of incisional hernias uh, almost vanishing from from my own practice to becoming around ten percent. Uh, this is fading out from the IPOM repair, uh, where we use intraperitoneal mesh. One of the reasons being that we have an increased risk of morbidity when we put an intraperitoneal mesh implant intraperitoneal. Uh, and it might work well for a lot of patients, maybe 90, 95%, but there are still some, uh, several patients that have severe adhesions, although you use an anti-adhesive mesh. Next to the approach, open laparoscopic or robotic, there was a big shift also in my own practice from the position where we put mesh for ventral hernia, uh, being intraperitoneal for almost half of my patients before the robotic era, going down to 10% uh, with a large shift towards uh, retromuscular repair uh, in my practice. You can do preperitoneal repair. That's another option. Uh, another option we uh, described and we developed is the TARUP approach, which is a transabdominal retromuscular approach, which was previously described laparoscopically, but which we now had adopted to uh, 
robotic surgery. Also there we saw a decline in the timing and I think by now uh, could say it takes too long. It's about one hour for an umbilical hernia 15 by 15 mesh. It's obviously is longer than such a small patch, but it's quite a different operation. And in my opinion, a more durable operation. Is it too expensive? If you compare to IPOM repair, you gain on the mesh, you gain on the fixation. So there actually it evils out a little bit. Is there a clinical benefit? I do think that that uh, that not having an intraperitoneal mesh, uh, not putting penetrating fixation is a benefit for the patients. We are working on filling out all these boxes. We are working on a study on the, the TAREP with one year, one month follow up. Uh, another important evolution, I think, is the ETAP, which can also be done robotically, either from lateral or suprapubic docking approach. Uh, but of course, timing is too short to explain all that. Uh, coming to the last one, the Robotar, which is about the patients that need component separation to close their, uh, their midline before you place a mesh, because we went away from the bridging towards the augmentation. And actually, we see a shift there from this open approach, large open incisions towards minimal invasive repair with large meshes with actually a big benefit for the patient. I think this is really the niche uh, of indications where the, the, the value of the robot is, 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 is really outstanding uh, for the patient. It has been shown by some American studies uh, who were of course a bit in front of us with gathering data. This is unpublished data. This is now being submitted for publication from uh, our center and the center of Teralatio in Finland. Seeing the same thing, comparing about uh, 100, what is it, 160 patients. Uh, retrospective, so it has a lot of limitations, although both groups were quite comparable. The width and the length of the hernia was bigger in the open group, so there might be some selection bias there. It takes a bit longer. Uh, some other descriptions, not enough time to go into detail, but the outcome is really what, what similar to what we found in these American publications, a decrease of uh, length of hospital stay by at least 50% from about seven to 3.5 days. Overall complications are less. Uh, uh, actually performing a better surgery, less post-operative hospital stay. This is the main thing of this study. This has to be followed, of course, by, by more unbiased, more studies with less limitations, being a prospective randomized study, which we're trying to set up uh, in Europe at the moment. It takes time to learn how to do the robotic platform, but uh, what you're looking for is really these patients walking home two days after surgery, after placing a a mesh which is about 45 by 40, and actually this patient also had a parastomal hernia. So timing, it takes time in the beginning, it goes down as well. There's also a learning curve effect. I think it will take about 20 to 25 cases before you come comfortable with the timing of a robot R. Um, and also your anesthetist, your R staff, uh, and for many surgeons like me, this is like two years, you know. So it takes time to invest, but I think that uh, uh, my task for the coming years is to fill out all these boxes. I'm, I'm actually working on that, trying to find out also the, the cost for ventral, for Robotar, uh, also the timing of the Robotar. We have to uh, create evidence for all these things. Uh, so basically, at this moment, my 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 takeaway from from all this grid at this moment is uh, is is green for most of the ventral and the robotar, still a bit red for the the groin hand repairs. So thank you. I'm happy to take all your question and apologize for the false start of the presentation. Yeah, it's it's very nice presentation. Actually, uh, you answered some of our questions uh, because uh, it's related to the robotic surgery but uh, we, we want to discuss much and uh, also we expect contributions from the audience and the questions they can uh, chat us and we, we will uh, direct the questions to philip 
Uh, first, I will share my screen with the questions. So, uh, Alex, uh, I will hand over the uh, speech to you and you can continue. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you, Philip, for the uh, great presentation. And uh, uh, like always with some uh, still unpublished data that uh, we all uh, uh, expect and see, it's uh, uh, always nice to see that you're still working on uh, the, the, the research uh, uh, because uh, it is very important not only to think that something is good or bad, but also to be able to uh, uh, give the evidence. Um, so um, before we did uh, some kind of uh, warm up uh, polls on our Twitter uh, audience about robotic uh, hernia surgery, for example, we asked if they do it. 12% uh, said yes. Uh, the other said no. Uh, 24 because it's too expensive. And um, 24 because they saw no clinical benefit. Of course, this doesn't, uh, we didn't uh, uh, spoke of its uh, ventral uh, groin or uh, more complex areas, but uh, we do see the um, concerns uh, people have uh, over there. Uh, then um, we asked another question. Uh, Hakan, can you change to the other one? Okay. I have the... Uh, okay. Yeah. If they do it, uh, like we said. Okay. I will do the rest, I have them there. Um, is it, uh, does it take longer than uh, laparoscopic? The majority said yes, 48%, uh, um, almost one in two. Um, the, um, we asked if the robotic platform does the extra peritoneal access easier. Uh, uh, um, and then uh, people said yes, uh, um, over half, exactly. And uh, we would uh, uh, like you. You asked you. You answered that question in your uh, um, in your presentation uh, um, as well. Uh, is it is it correct that you think that uh, the robotic eases the extra peritoneal placement of mesh? Yeah, I, I think so. I Basically, today was a hard day for me because I had five cases and the urologist, uh, no, the gynecologist, uh, they, they booked two cases and they went over time. And uh, so I basically had to do two ventral hernias uh, laparoscopic with straight sticks. And uh, there definitely is a big difference. I can tell you uh, it's uh, there, there is a big difference in the Certainly for ventral hernia repair, when you're going to do the dissection on the anterior abdominal wall, whether it is being preperitoneal or retromuscular, you're going to close the midline, closing a defect, then you will close a flap. Uh, the, 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 there is a big added value of the wristed instruments, uh, for sure. That, that's undeniable. That is also make, uh, I assume it's uh, the ergonomical uh, aspect of it. It's something that is not always uh, shown in the studies, but it's for the uh, individual surgeon, uh, of course, very important. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to do the suturing on the anterior abdominal wall being next to the patient. Uh, uh, it is. And also the tackering, as you know, when you, when you want to tacker, certainly, uh, I don't do a lot of IPOM anymore, but you want to tacker the mesh towards the side that becomes towards you. You're almost Actually, you're kneeling down to, to be able to tackle that. Uh, that's for sure. The big question, of course, is, is it better for the patient? And that's what we, uh, I'm, I'm, it's easier for the surgeon. And I think if you suture a defect or a midline laparoscopically with straight sticks compared to, or, or ETAP with straight sticks compared to robotically, your suture will be less precise will always be less like monotonous and you want the suture to be a bit boring, to be always the same. 
Um, and certainly that's that's different with the robotic platform compared to with straight six because you you really handle the needle much more 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 proficiently. Uh, but are we doing better surgery? That's the question. Are the patients happier? Uh, do they have a better outcome? That's what we we strive for. Okay. And then uh, next question is um, is about the future of uh, um, robotic versus laparoscopy. If robotic hernia uh, will replace laparoscopy in the future, that is certainly the opinion of the majority of our uh, audience. Uh, uh, two in three uh, think that uh, robotics will replace laparoscopy. Uh, do you feel that way? I think it's the wrong question because basically for me, robotic surgery is laparoscopic surgery. I always, I will never talk about robotic surgery. I always talk about uh, robot assisted laparoscopic surgery. It is laparoscopic surgery using a robotic platform, using an interface, a computer between a console. So, uh, that's what I think. And I do think that with, with there will be, there, there, there are some advantages and we as surgeons, we will start using the tools. Uh, robots will become more, more disseminated. You, as you know, there are other robots coming uh, from big companies. So there will be a big push for it. And I think it will replace most of the uh, conventional straight stick laparoscopy uh, for sure. When it becomes more affordable, when prices go down, it will be, it, in 10, 10 years, it will be mainstream. Five years, maybe too soon, but 10 days it will be. Uh, but of course, it also laparoscopic surgery is not, not everywhere. Recently, there was a paper from Spain where less than 10% of groin hernias are done minimal invasive. So, so even there, there is, there is still a, a, big, uh, a big gap between uh, uh, the evolution towards minimal invasive. But I think robotic assisted laparoscopic surgery is the future. And yes, okay. this is the important question. Is robotic surgery ergonomic, Philip? Well, uh, there is, there is a yes and a no. Uh, of course, it's important, like many people that work in an office and sit on a desk all day, they do have ergonomic complaints, you know. So there is, I think, still uh, some research to do is how is the best position of the robot take platform for the surgeon. I, basically, I think, I think companies should do more research than it. I think the console should come with the most ergonomic uh, chair as well, because I proctor and the chair is different in every, every hospital. Uh, ranging for, from uh, very cheap ones, which you cannot and, and heighten or not. So there is a big difference. And, and I think needs, research needs to be done. Uh, there is certainly a shift uh, in ergonomic. I, uh, when, when I do a bilateral laparoscopic groin hernia repair, I have pain in my knee. If I do a bilateral groin hernia repair with the robot, I might have pain in the neck if I don't uh, sit correctly. So there is a difference. There is certainly a shift. Yeah, it's, but, it's you know, uh, to, uh, to emb embedding the face to, to a screen, you know, uh, and keep uh, and stay for hours. Uh, it's not good for the leg, I guess. It's not ergonomic. Yeah, and you say four hours, I work 12 hours a day sometimes, so. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, but, but one of the things what, what we don't really see in ergonomics is the, the, if you have a task as a surgeon, you want to close the midline. If you are in a position like you do it in the conventional laparoscopy, this, this task will be performed less uh, well, in my opinion, than you are doing it from a robotic console. And that's also part of ergonomics. That's the the dexterity of the instruments combined with the ease how you read the site where you want to do your surgery. So it's ergonomics is more than only uh, 
the surgeon having less awkward positions or less strain on their body, but also the ergonomics makes sure together with the other advantages that you can perform your task better. Uh, and the end result as might be better uh, from that. So ergonomics is more than only the position. It's also uh, when you sit well and when you feel comfortable, you probably are performing your task better. Mm -hmm. This is a very important point, I think. Um, can we discuss this as well? If it takes uh, longer than uh, laparoscopic and um, exactly what is after all your experience uh, also through this robust uh, project, uh, what is your opinion? What is the major drawback or concern of robotic hernia repair? What, uh, um, what should be aware or uh, what should we want to, to better or change? So I think one of the, the, the things, uh, the study is a single surgeon study. All the patients that described in this paper are operated by me, which is, of course, some bias because you become like an expert in robotic hernia repair. Uh, so if you if you look at the transmittability to other people, it might be a bit different. Like if you say, okay, you, my, my learning curve was 25, for somebody else, it might be a bit longer because I have a long experience with laparoscopic surgery. That's one of the limitations of this study uh, to, to, to get external validity. Uh, the robotic hernia repair has a robotic platform for hernia repair. One of the drawbacks, of course, is the cost. You need a robot to be able to do it. Uh, and second is the trajectory to how to become proficient and how to introduce this uh, new tool in your practice safely for the patient. And there's, there's a lot of work uh, that has to be done. And one of the things, even if you're an accomplished surgeon, is that you have to realize it, that you have to stand back and learn to work with this new platform uh, because you are treating patients. And there are potentially some complications that you can have. Uh, one of the things that I do think about the robotic platform that uh, as you, if you follow the, the Facebook group, International Hernia Collaboration, you see people doing ETAP TAR, so like a complex uh, abdominal wall uh, surgery using straight stick instruments like uh, Viktor Radu, uh, Igor Bilyansky, Vlad Burdakov. Uh, but I do think that if you do these techniques with the robotic platform, there will be a larger cohort of surgeons being able to do that. Uh, I think that it, 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 it's not to say that it, you need less skills, but with the added advantages of the robotic platform, the dexterity of the instruments, uh, the control of your camera, I do think that more surgeons will be able to do this uh, sometimes difficult surgery uh, in the for the benefit of the patients compared to laparoscopic, which Salvador Morales does, uh, or ETAP, which uh, Victor Rado does uh, with straight sticks. And um, recently there are uh, in the market uh, laparoscopic instruments that are wristed. Uh, yeah. uh, um, these but are called like the robot for the, for, for the, for the poor. But uh, is it uh, directly comparable, or are we just talking about one aspect of the robot? Uh, that yeah, is what what you I, I summoned up what I find the five advantages yeah. of a robotic platform, and everything that comes uh, next usually doesn't have one of these things. Yeah, uh, like the surgeon ergonomics will not be there if you use this. Might even be a bit worse. If you use these uh, these 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 laparoscopic uh, tools, uh, you don't have the enhanced visualization. The question is how much of your advantages compared to the the standard you could call it is the Da Vinci robot compared to the standard that you will lose and will still be able to get the benefit from a robotic platform. That's the question. Uh, all the robots will be 3D, but like the immersive effect of the console, which is the fifth one, which is something that I do like, and, and many robotic surgeons do like, 
uh, you don't have with any, uh, any of the other systems that are coming. How much will this make a difference? Uh, you have robots on the market with wristed instrument, but less degrees of, of freedom. Like instead of uh, uh, eight, you have only six or four degrees of freedom. Um, and with this laparoscopic instruments, of course, you have the you have the, uh, the ergonomics, which is not there probably. Uh, I have never used them, so I can, I'm speaking only on a, a hypothetic case. Yeah. So the, there are some questions from the audience. Uh, Martin Simons says uh, skin to skin is not fair. Total time and number of repairs in one day matters. And Andrew Debo uh, adds, you mentioned no different skin to skin time in robot inguinal. What was patient arrived to the anesthetic room to leave for recovery time? This is the time that determine, determines how many cases in a day. So I'm trying to see all these questions. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a question I often get, skin to skin time and what with the docking of the robot? The docking of the robot is within the skin to skin time, you know? So you make your skin incision, then you dock. There might be some time, some more, a bit more preparation time, which is uh, putting the sleeves around the, the robotic arms. But if you have a high turnover, and I, and, and I have never mentioned, like Andrew asked, which is the time in the, in the recovery room, arriving to the, to the, to the anesthetic room. Uh, we have never meant, measured that, but I can tell you there is probably no difference at all uh, in, in, in all these timings. I'm pretty, for groin hernias, I'm pretty convinced that after a learning curve, Almost everywhere, people will be able to do this just as quickly and do as many cases in a day program as with the robotic platform. But it will take a while. In our, in our case, it was 25 cases because the nurses were experienced. If your nursing staff is completely new, this might be 50 cases. Or if you have a surgeon that never done a laparoscopic groin hair repair, uh, not that many laparoscopic groin here, but it will take longer, things like that. So there is, there is, there is uh, so many this and that. But I am convinced that that for the efficacy of your hospital for groin hernia, this is not this is not an issue. For robotar, it is. For robotic tar, uh, your first robotar when you get trained will take you six, seven, or hours. Uh, and this decreases slowly to maybe three or four hours, which is still longer than an open tar in most uh, most cases. So uh, for raw tar, there is a gap, but there, of course, you have the benefit for the patient outcome, which you don't have for the groin hernia. Yeah, it's. I don't know whether that answered the questions. Yeah, a another question from Cesare Stabilini. He, he asked that, "What's your?" Prehabilitation schedule and post-operative regimen for the, this complex case, I guess. So, uh, prehabilitation. One of the things that that I do some, if we're talking about Botox things like that, I I I do some Botox, but not very frequently. I became convinced that certainly, if your patient is obese and you want to treat a big, a wide hernia that needs. Uh, might need some form of component separation. Having them to lose weight is a very efficient way to, to get more laxity and more possibility to advance your, your flaps. Um, but of course, that's not possible in every case. So I do some Botox. I've never done a preperitoneum, one of these uh, pneumoperitoneums. I have no experience with that, so I cannot comment on that. Um, after the surgery, uh, I want patients to mobilize as quickly as possible, uh, and uh, they I, they refrain from heavy weight lifting during about three weeks. That's the only thing that I that I give them. Um, one of the things that and you saw the last picture of the lady walking home uh, after a, ro a robotic tar. Um, 
why are they doing so well? There are two things. They have remarkably low pain levels postoperatively after a minimal invasive robotic component separation, and they don't have ileus. They eat, they tolerate food and drink almost immediately. And these are the two drivers, I think, for a rapid mobilization, a rabbit and a rapid uh, return uh, home. Um, it's, I have a personal question. But, uh, what do you expect or want to uh, feature improvements from the robotic platforms? What, what things that you, you, you should, uh, they should uh, improve and develop to the, uh, add uh, to the robotic platform? What technologies? Do you have any uh, comments? So there, there are some things that, that there will be, uh, of, co of course, for hernia, it's not that important. What I've been waiting for a long time, instead of putting a ruler inside a patient and measure, as I would like to have a robot that where I say, I make a point, I say the next point and the robot tells me this is 4.65 uh, centimeters apart. So to be able to measure, uh, of course, for other fields of surgery, like liver surgery, colorectal, the, the mapping in the image of, of important information uh, will be something that will become important uh, probably. Uh, the XI system is over-designed for hernia surgery. Most of the time, there's a fourth arm that you're not going to use that is hanging there uh, and in your way. So I think in the future, probably we'll see robots that are more designed for a specific task, like maybe in your hospital, like in ours, we now have a robot for orthopedics where the, this robot, the only thing it can do is a knee uh, surgery. So that's, that's what it does. So we might come up with robotic systems that are a bit less expensive and, and, and less well designed than the XI robot just to perform, uh, let's say, a groin hernia repair, a robotic uh, system just for groin hernia. For example, I can imagine this happening. The single incision is something that is might come up. I've, uh, there is an SP system now developed by, by Intuitive. I don't know whether for hernia repair this will become an issue or whether it will be like the SILS that came and that went, uh, the SILS surgery for laparoscopy. Uh, many people were quite, quite uh, uh, favorable of it and then it went away slowly. I don't really know why. Um, so maybe that's the same with the SP system. Of course, that's a big cost. Uh, and I do think that's typically a case where you have a robot that might be very handy in a specific situation. So I think the SP in the US, it's on the market now for the, the maxillofacial surgery is a very, very good tool. Uh, they're very happy with it and, and, and will probably in that field become state of the art in a few years. Uh, also the transanal dissection, the TAP TME, which I don't do. Uh, maybe something like an SP system, a single port system, uh, with the, the, the instruments coming out. Whether for hernia, I don't know. I, um, you might do a, a restopper repair with, from a single port, suprapubic, things like that. That might be the future, but I don't know. But your hospital will never buy a robot just for hernia surgery. So you have to always have to. Have to uh, they might try to, uh, they might try to uh, remove two, 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 two middle uh, arms from the tower and put the uh, SP module, uh, single port, you know, single port has four uh, arms and two side arms, six arms, they, they might try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Six and, arms robotic, and also, uh, also several of the new robots that are coming are mod modular. They have like, uh, they have one, one, one thing you roll in for one arm. So if you need three arms, you only roll in the three arms. You don't roll in a whole system with four arms, whether that will be, it makes it more versatile. And, and we as surgeons, it's our task to find out what, what will be, uh, what, what will, will benefit ourselves and our patients. Um, we have an additional uh, um, add-on question from Barbara Ist. 
uh, about this is, uh, would you appreciate a form of CT combined vision, uh, similar to what the neurosurgeons use, like a navigation system able to say where the structures are uh, um, in hernia surgery? Uh, for hernia surgery, um, that might, uh, I think only for the very complex cases, like if you, if you want to do a, a TAR, a component separation, whether you would be able to see where the different uh, layers are. Uh, on the other hand, if it's, uh, it's a hernia patient with a wide hernia, this is all so much disrupted that... Uh, for hernia surgery, I don't really at this moment see a very big, a big value for it. I might be wrong. I never know. But the CT combined vision, no, I don't think. What could be, what could be uh, handsome is like for parastomal hernias, which I learned now from international hernia collaboration. I haven't done yet. Is in an ileal condor. It put some ICG in it, so you recognize the loop immediately. And I've been like in for many years trying to identify the loop of the ileal condoid. And just by putting some ICG in the loop and then put on your firefly, you immediately see this is the loop. Uh, so this is fantastic. And this will this will definitely make these are the small steps that you can you can have. But the CT combined vision for hernia, not for liver surgery, that's a completely different thing. I think for a, a liver surgeon that wants to remove a nodule somewhere in that uh, in that liver or, or for colon surgery or pancreatic surgery, for sure. But for hernia, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm doubting. Um, we have another question from the chat from Ioannis uh, um, Yerojanis. It's about um, the differences uh, in hospital stay between a lab uh, ETEP and a robotic assisted one. Um, he's doing lab ATEPs and people stay from 24 to 68 hours. Uh, uh, he says, what is your experience in this? So I have, uh, I have very little experience with straight stick uh, ETAP, uh, basically none. So all the ETAPs that I've done are robot assisted. I would not expect there would be a big difference. Uh, because what we see uh, also for the, the TAR patients, for the complex patients, the difference is mainly taking them from open to minimal invasive. And the difference between different minimal invasive techniques become, uh, become small. Certainly, if you're going to do the same dissection, you place the same mesh in the same retromuscular plane. Of course, there will there might be a difference between a laparoscopic IPOM and a laparoscopic ETAP or a robot-assisted retromuscular repair because these are different techniques. And I, I do think that their IPOM repairs usually don't go home the same day in my practice because of pain, while most of the extra peritoneal repairs robotically or laparoscopically are able to go home the same day. Uh, so I would not expect if this specific question, I would not expect there be a big difference. Okay. Um, we have a question from uh, Cesare Stabilini about the issue of uh, spin and bias that was uh, recently uh, uh, discussed and raised. Um, and he asked, is there, what is your opinion? Is there a return of the foes of laparoscopy this time against robotics? Yeah, of course, spin is not specifically specifically for robotic surgery. It's in everything. Like, like uh, if you do a study on prevention of incisional hernia with a mesh and you have your outcomes, uh, you want, as a researcher, you like it to be an outcome that is, that is useful and it is uh, significant and that is, is beautiful and everybody will talk about it. Uh, so I think it's an attitude and, and I think you learn that through the years. And I think there's a big, a big uh, job there for the reviewers and the editors to, to, to get the conclusions really in contact with the data that it describes, because that's what you very often see people describe uh, series or that are 
often not that high level of evidence, retrospective things like that. And that conclusion is like overwhelming. So that is something that we have to try to get out. And I think, and you, you, might, you might show me uh, from my own papers, some examples that it, I didn't do that, but uh, most of the time I try to, to limit my own uh, over enthusiasm about the results of my study. And then uh, also uh, you have to describe your limitations and your conclusions should always be in line with what you found and don't over uh, overblow what you found. And something that we also often see is don't make recommendations from a single study, even from a meta-analysis. It's not the job of an individual researcher or research group to make recommendations. That is the job of the European Heritage Society or other. So don't make recommendations. Don't say everybody should use a mesh now for an aneurysm repair because we found that it's better. It's not like that. You just have to say, okay, we did this study. We found less incisional hernias after a preventive mesh, whatever. We did a robot tower. We found a decrease in hospital stay from seven to 3.5 days. This is what we found. We're not going to recommend that everybody should start doing robotic tar. That's not the task of that individual study. That's the task of a guidelines group. Very nice. And, you know, uh, uh, Alex, uh, may, may I ask you a question? Yeah. Philip, you know, you, you have experience with the other robotic platforms that Daniel Lopez is going ask me, what do you think of new robotic platforms? Are all at the end it the same for hernia surgery? No. Is there any difference? No. Uh, I, I have some experience with the CMR robot, and I can tell you the... the uh, what I always try to say, a CMR robot that is now marketed is the first, uh, the first generation of that robot, while the Da Vinci robot is a fourth. So they've gone through a lot of changes, and and uh, a lot of depends on the quality of instruments, things like that. So uh, are all the robotic platforms the same? No, I think that all the ones that I've seen, they are always a bit different from. Well, you can turn it how you want. The Da Vinci is the standard, which if you compare the other, the other things that are coming. Um, with the others, I have no clinical experience. I've just seen pictures like you have on congresses and things like that. But there will be promising platforms for sure. Uh, and I think that XI is over-designed for hernia surgery. You could easily do all hernia surgery with an X robot, which is way cheaper. Uh, so you might also do hernia surgery with a less expensive robot with less less uh, fancy instruments. But the question is, how much can you decrease all these things and still be uh, at the same level of benefit that you have? And Andy Debo asks that you talk about robot assistant. Any thoughts on the true robotic operations replacing us as surgeons, minimum human input. In yeah, the, in I think the, it, it, it will be possible for some tasks because indeed uh, at this moment, the robots, they, are not, they don't really qualify as robots. They don't do independent uh, tasks. There's, it's always a, a master controller situation, uh, a controller and, and, and the device situation. So you, you will always have, have a this, but I think there might be, and hernia surgery might be one of those where, for example, you're going to put a mesh and if you want to suture the mesh, you will uh, tell the robot suture the mesh in some way, suture the mesh half a centimeter from the edge with so much steps in between with this suture and the robot could do that and that they could do that autonomously. Whether we will see a robot doing uh, a groin hernia repair, for example, completely autonomous, I think it's possible because we couldn't even expect what we are doing now when we go 10 years back. Um, so whether you could say, okay, we have a groin hernia, we have some imaging or not, or we just rely and you put your throw cards and then we say the robot do a groin hernia repair, uh, because of 
artificial intelligence, they might get data from maybe 5,000 different operations and say, okay, this is a different area and then start doing the surgery and maybe at a certain point ask the surgeon, is this still okay? Can I do it? And of course you need a red button to, to stop the robot, certainly at the beginning. Uh, I think it's, it's, it will come, uh, but I'm not sure. The whole idea is that I will operate my own groin hernia uh, when it becomes symptomatic with my own input. So input from 3,000 of my own operations operate my own hernia with my own input by a robot. That would be it's, nice. Yeah, it's first of all, with the uh, uh, artificial intelligence probably, yeah. I think the first thing, we, groin hernia is a bit complex because you have all the vessels, the nerves. Uh, I think the orthopedics are probably the first to be, go out of a job because you have the good imaging of the, of the, 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 the bones. Yeah. And when you locate it, you could probably tell a robot, like go there, 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 and, and start cutting and sizing it uh, and, and uh, do autom automated tasks. I don't know whether the current, I have never seen a robotic orthopedic uh, operation. So I don't know whether they do autonomous tasks already. Uh, I must check it out. I will do that. I, I believe they do the cutting on uh, knee replacement. Yeah, uh, they, 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 pro they probably would do that better than, than yeah. with the human variations you have. So whether a groin hernia dissection uh, might be done better in the future uh, and less, less, less with less variation uh, by a robot might be true. I don't know. Maybe the the, the research uh, that I've seen uh, basically in uh, in the U.S. Uh, regarding autonomous uh, robots uh, until now they're mainly uh, on suturing. They do yeah. uh, that uh, seems to work out okay within limitations, but I uh, share your point that uh, probably this is where things will go uh, when it's very hard to predict at the moment uh, because uh, if we see how it evolves with uh, autonomous driving, the technology may be there, but there are also other problems uh, uh, that also affect the, the general uh, users of this. Yeah. And so one of the things that I've I've heard, I don't know whether these projects are really running at the moment, is that they they would go to surgeons, which they they would go and call expert, and say during the hernia surgery, the robot would ask questions every time, and each time it is this the this nerve, is this is this the epigastric vessels, is this the cord, is this the ductus. And the robot would learn. So that surgeon would each time say yes or no, no. And, and, and so the robot would learn each time how to identify different structures. And if you do that with enough surgeons and with enough operations, uh, I don't know whether it would be impossible for the robot to do a completely independent dissection. So one thing you would need is an anesthetist that skips a lot of enough of uh, colorization so the patient won't move, probably. Maybe we need robots for the anesthetists to replace them. They might be doing an even good job. And I think we have one last question. Last question, Alexei. Yeah, from um, Yasir that she's asking what is the best uh, almost ergonomic uh, choice for fixation while doing robotic hernia surgery. Is it suture, is it adhesive agents, or is it tax? Well, you, I, I think when we talk about groin hernia, tax are out of business. I think that we should not use penetrating fixation for groin hernia. Then you have options. You can either use a pre-shaped mesh that without fixation, you can use glue or you can use anti-adhesive uh, meshes uh, for groin hernia. For others, for ventral hernia, uh, in the retromuscular plane, usually you don't need a lot of fixation. You can put some sutures or 
uh, in a reef stopper, you can use a self-fixating mesh. For the large dissections, like the, the, the posterior component separation, usually we don't do any fixation at all because you rely on the massive size of the mesh and the pressure. Uh, so, but for groin hernia, no tax, please. Yeah. So we have come to end of the, this month's, month's uh, journal club. Thank you for uh, joining us, Philip. Uh, great discussion and contribution and presentation. And thank you, Alex. Thank you to the audience. They also contributed their asked questions. Hope to say, see you in the next journal club. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you.